Welcome back to Morning Joe. Uh, as you can see there in Brussels, Belgium, world leaders are getting ready to pose for the family photo, which is a tradition at the NATO summit. Um, wow. Uh, the pretty grand uh, background here in Brussels. You can see the world leaders are all posing, keeping their straight faces on uh, as they get ready right for that picture to be taken. We've been watching these leaders uh, walk across the stage. Uh, and pump fists with the uh, NATO Secretary General as they get ready, not only for this big meeting, but for this big moment in this photo, Joe. I'm curious your thoughts, Richard Haas, as we look at uh, the images of the world leaders, Angela Merkel and, of course, President Biden um, and uh, Boris Johnson's hair. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Other than that, they all look like they're being beamed into space, standing there uh, I know, awkwardly. Look at this. The, uh, not sure what that's meant to be. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of them are really preoccupied uh, by their domestic situation. Merkel is, is retiring. Macron faces the political fight of his life. Johnson still is dealing with the aftermath of, of Brexit and some of the problems with uh, COVID with, North, with Northern Ireland. Uh, but, yeah, they're coming together. I think they're relieved that the United States is in some ways the United States they remember, that you've got a more traditional American uh, president. So I, find, I think they find this a lot easier. But underneath this camaraderie, Joe, again, there are some really big policy differences uh, about uh, not just defense spending, about relations with Russia, relations with uh, China, and real questions. I mean, I think the most interesting question for NATO is probably cyber now. How does NATO deal with this whole new domain, this whole new dimension of threats? And Russia's clearly willing and able to use it. But what are the appropriate responses? Are they in kind? Are they symmetrical? It, it raises real questions about the future of, of this alliance. So it's, and I guess one other thing is obviously Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the Biden decision is essentially the Trump policy four months later. And it raises real questions of alliance solidarity and what happens next there. So, yeah, they're feeling better. But there's a but. And underneath it, I think there's a little bit of, of uh, unease uh, about things. You know, there, there was obviously open hostility between Donald Trump and several world leaders. Uh, things got especially testy with Angela Merkel in Germany. Uh, talk about that relationship and what comes next after Merkel. Well, let me say two things. First, about the, the, the you're right about the way you describe it. After Merkel, uh, not clear. You just had some small elections in Germany. Still not clear what the future looks like. What's the nature of the coalition? Is it cent you know, how center left it is? You've also got the rise of the far right. It's not a threat to the collective national government. But I think there's real issues in, in Germany as to what constitutes the center, how strong Germany is going to be. But you, have, you face a situation where, and I never thought I'd say this, right now, out of all the countries in Europe, the ones with the most stable leadership might be Italy under Mario Draghi. And you look at what's going on in France or Germany, lots of uh, lots of uncertainty there. The other thing, Joe, and we haven't talked about it much, is, you know, as welcome as Joe Biden is, I think a lot of these Europeans look at us and they wonder, is Joe Biden simply a four-year phenomenon? And ultimately, Donald Trump or Trumpism does not now represent where the United States is. They're looking at what's going on here domestically. They literally don't know when they look at us, what is now the new normal and what's the aberration? Is Biden the aberration or is Biden the restoration of the United States they thought they knew? And what will happen in the Republican Party under Trump or Ron DeSantis or whomever? So what we've done is we've introduced a degree of uh, unpredictability into this alliance, which mm -hmm. for nothing else for three quarters of a century was pretty staid. And I think that's the other backdrop to this meeting. Now, you know, what's so fascinating is you are exactly right. Uh, of course, Richard, uh, our, our allies have to be looking at what's happening with the United States and wondering what's next. You, you, you bring up Ron DeSantis. We, we could also talk about uh, a number of, of leaders in the United States Senate who were Republicans that obviously would cause similar concerns. It is always important to remember, though, Mika, even during the Trump years, uh, even during Helsinki, it seemed uh, at times often when when he would bend over backwards uh, and, and be obsequious to Vladimir Putin, uh, even Republicans in the United States Senate felt the necessity. In fact, even Mike Pence 
uh, at times felt the necessity to strike an almost Reagan-like uh, uh, approach uh, to the Russians uh, and, yeah. and, and, and passing uh, extremely harsh sanctions against Russia. Uh, so it is going to be interesting to see what the future looks like. But unless Donald Trump himself is reelected in 2024, I suspect uh, U.S. foreign policy, Republican foreign policy, would probably look much more like Reagan's than Trump's. I, I think so. But I think the sort of um, the, the, the weakening within this country, whether it be, you know, how we deal with January 6th, the insurrection there, uh, whether or not Republicans um, are, are sort of reinforcing Trump's legacy in, um, in state policies, voting rights. I think these are things Vladimir Putin can point to. Uh, as as this country being weakened by Trump or, uh, in, in his respect, even taking the time during his interview with Keir Simmons to talk about what a great man Trump is, um, I, I think there is a degree of power and force that still remains in the Trump legacy. And Joe Biden is taking every waking moment of his presidency to try and put that behind us. But it's going to be tough as we have these ongoing issues here in the United States. Well, as, as, as any expert of Russia would tell you, um, they, they absolutely, Vladimir Putin and also uh, any Russian leader is going to take whatever divisions sure. they can find. And they're going to, to use those divisions against the United States. Uh, so when they hear Democrats uh, calling voting laws in Georgia Jim Crow 2.0 or in Texas Jim mm -hmm. Crow 2.0, uh, they're going to use those divisions against the United States. So uh, it, 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 it's a good, good opportunity for us to be mindful uh, to fight against voting restrictions that would actually take us backwards, but also to be very careful with the rhetoric that we use in describing voting laws that may not be that different than uh, yeah. they were before the pandemic and certainly are not uh, any more onerous than what you find in New York State often. Yeah.